Act and Michelle Ngele and continue with that interview. Remember, you're welcome to participate. And later on, on the political point, we'll be having two presidential candidates just to give you a teaser of what we are looking forward to. But for now, I'd like to hand over back to Michelle. And of course, uh, Esther Pasaris has been outlining her plans for Nairobi County should she clinch that position. But of course, your plans are only dependent on whether you do clinch that position on August the 8th. What's your campaign strategy? Well, I mean, the thing is, I'm campaigning on my own and at the same time with Team Nairobi, mm -hmm. okay? Um, we, uh, we're a party that has fielded candidates for governor, deputy governor, senate, and we've got MPs and we've got MCAs. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do joint campaigns on the ground, mm -hmm. but I'm also going to be going out to various areas as well to talk to women groups and to talk to men. There's also a perception that the woman rep seat is only women who vote. I've had this question asked by men, or oh, that's a woman's seat. They're not aware that they vote. So I feel in terms of civic education, IABC has failed mm -hmm. uh, in making sure people understand that you vote, also men vote for the women rep position. Right. They think that this is only a position that women vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's very interesting. And of course, um, as your campaign strategy goes on, we've seen you also take a stab at the governorship before. Uh, why did you decide now to run for the women rep position? Well, um, it was very expensive, first of all. The budgets were uh, very high. Uh -huh. And then also, uh, truth be told, um, when I went to see IABC the very first time and I said, um, I'd like to run for women rep, I'll be finishing my degree in graduating in August, right. you know, so can I be cleared on transcripts? They said yes. And then when I went back again to verify, they said no. We need you to have graduated before May. Uh -huh. So I just thought to myself, you know, I'm not going to try and get another controversy here. Um, and also the funding. And I actually started going to see the governor on a few issues as I started my campaign for the governorship. And I realized that, you know, there was a school demolished, there were border borders arrested. And as I went to see Governor Kidero and I said, can we sort this out? Can we sort this out? I realized that I can actually work with the governor and solve the problems. I don't have to be the governor. It's, uh, I think it's important that you have, you climb the steps gradually. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my supporters, I had 300,000 votes in the last election, and everybody was still telling me, Esther, we want you in government. Right. Please, forget about the governor's seat. It's not doable right now. And then, of course, there was Peter Kenneth running, and I was getting a lot of people feeling that, oh, you're just a spoiler, you're trying to take your votes, you're a spoiler for Jubilee. So I just thought, you know what? I prayed about it, and for me, I just felt, let me just go for the woman rep seat. Mm -hmm. And then there's another thing is I joined, I applied to be part of a fellowship that Hillary Clinton started called Vital Voices, mm -hmm. which unites women all over the world. And out of 400 applicants, I was one of the successful ones. There were two Kenyans who were accepted into Vital Voices. Right. In fact, I'm going next week to South Africa That's for great. the induction. And that is a platform to help and empower women. So for me, it seemed like this is what God wants me to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the question of whether it is a level playing ground in the political scene for women is still burning. Not very long ago, you were in the media um, explaining a situation where you were accosted by goons at the University of Nairobi, where you went to also address um, a, an event to do with women as well. Um, in terms of security and in terms of campaigning as a woman in this campaign period, how is it like? Okay, first of all, uh, you know, I mean, yes, they do behave like goons, uh, but they are children, mm -hmm. okay? Um, what happened in the university should not have happened, and there is a failure there, and I am going to make that an issue, because I know that the police and the University of Nairobi have an, have an agreement that you will not come in unless the university security call you. Mm -hmm. So when I called the police and said, I'm being held hostage, they said the university security needs to call me, and for me, that's a failure, all right? Um, the... We've made politics of Kenya about money. And as leaders, when we go and ask for votes and we make all these promises, their lives don't change. Mm -hmm. So when you go in there, not all the youth, let me get, um, you know, we were in, for instance, we were in Majengo with the governor. And we had about 500 youth. They, they listened to us, they saw us off. But about 20 who make this a career, and you see the same people in every place that you go. Mm -hmm. They get wind that you're going to this area, they come. They chase the car, they climb the car, they want money. All right, and you really, you, you really can't get away unless you give them something. Right. Because they damage your car, they, they, they're rough, they block you from the front, they even threaten to stone you. We were in uh, Madare the other day, mm -hmm. we were stoned. But this is also political. Sometimes it's, your, it's the fellow aspirants, sometimes it's the youth that feel this group got some money, we didn't get some money. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the politics of poverty. 
you know that is at play. Uh, yeah and then you you get criminals as well in it mm -hmm. so it's something that i think as we go and empower our people as we improve infrastructure in the informal settlements as we make people feel part and parcel of the country and the county mm -hmm. i think we will reduce this kind of uh, behavior. behavior but uh -huh. the, imagine you're a youth you accost a politician you make five or ten thousand You've earned your bread. So it's a job for them. Mm -hmm. It's a job. Let's follow them. Let's ask right. for the money. So let's focus on the fact that they held you hostage asking for, what was it, 150,000 oh, shillings? Yes. And, and this was, a, it was actually a, a Jubilee aspirant that had lost. Uh -huh. He's a, an expelled student. He's got so many cases. I actually decided, I haven't even gone to write my statement at, uh, at the police because he's already got about five cases waiting. Uh, and the university also know him. But the thing is, my question is, why did he get into the university ground? Mm -hmm. Why has the vice chancellor or the dean of students not called me to talk about it? Right. Why are they so disconnected? If you're a student at the Nairobi University and you're a woman and you are at the mercy of these students, it is sad. All right. So that is an issue I intend to address, not only in Nairobi University, in all the universities. Are the women safe in your institutions? Do you care? Now, that is a question of security there, but of yes. course also coming in there is a question of uh, seemingly voter bribery since we're asking for money anyway. And many politicians, especially the incumbents, would tell you you cannot run away from voter bribery if you want to clinch your position in Nairobi. You is know, that your stand? Yeah, we've got this buzzword called mobilization. Mm -hmm. And I really wish we could eliminate it. I remember when I was running in Embakasi, uh, everybody was saying on the day of election, do you have mobilization money? And I was like, for what? You know, I've campaigned about no money. Don't, don't vote because of money. Mm -hmm. But people have this expectation that just before they go and vote, there'll be 100 shillings or 50 shillings. And I'm saying that you need to go out and vote. You don't need to get that 50 shilling or that 100 shilling. Mm -hmm. This is the precedent that has been set by past leaders. I'm telling you, get up in the morning, get on the queue and vote. That 100 shilling or that 50 shilling or that 200 shilling is not worth your vote. Mm -hmm. For after, I mean, within a day, you're going to have consumed that money. All right? Vote with your conscience. God selects leaders. All right? right. But God needs you to put the leader that you want. You know, you pray about it. God, who do you want me to vote for? All right? Listen to the voice of God. Go there and vote. But if you're going to listen to that little handout that is going to be given so that you can go and vote, I mean, this no, is that's a problem. And that also brings in the issue of civic education, which you addressed earlier. Um, talking about how uh, when you go down to the grassroots, men ask you if men actually vote uh, for the woman representative. Exactly. Exactly. But then again, there's also the perception that women are their own worst enemy because women do make up the majority of the population. And so if it was women alone voting for the woman rep, then you'd expect that um, a lot more women would be in power. So in terms of really civic education, both for the men and the women in ensuring that more women men come to power, how much further do we need to go as a country? Um, I think we, you know, I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, the other day I went somewhere and I was just talking to a group of people and I said, women are not corrupt. Mm -hmm. And they basically said, what do you mean? Look at Waiguru, right. you know, she's all over the news, she's corrupt. And this is what I want to say, it's our institutional failures. Because right now as we are talking, we don't know whether Waiguru was the one who was responsible or was it some other people that she was trying to stop from stealing, all right? So it's, it's, it's open-ended. Mm -hmm. You cannot tell. But all I can tell you is when I look at the Huduma centers, all right, which are employing a lot of people, I see the hand of Waiguru there, mm -hmm. all right? She did a lot of lighting projects, all right? Now, there's also the division of tribe and partisan politics. I remember when she was lighting up Kibera, I was called and told, oh, there's this tender. Can you come in and tender? And I went in and I tended, and I was given seven lights. Mm -hmm. When she was lighting Madare, I was the most competitive by 30 million shillings. But in Madare, being a Kikuyu-prone area, they didn't need me. So I was actually told, you cannot, you, you know, I was blocked from the tender. Right. All right? So for me, I, 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 I looked at that as, okay, you're a woman, I'm cheaper. You don't want me in Madare? Because now I'm, I'm seen as not a Jubilee supporter. Mm -hmm. In fact, the tender went to people who were Jubilee affiliates or supporters, and the government spent 30 million shillings more. So I want to say that we still have institutional failures, because I did go to the tribunal, and the tribunal did not want to listen to the logic behind the case. Okay. They chose not to do that. So our institutions have to be strong and independent. Mm -hmm. If the anti-corruption worked, if the DPP's office worked, if the judiciary worked, we wouldn't have the problem. The police were telling me the other day, we keep arresting this OCS guy, all right? And every time we take him to court, he gets, the, the case keeps being put forward. Mm -hmm. So 
We can't do our job. We need strong institutions, independent institutions, to solve the problems. If we knew right now whether Waiguru was guilty or not, we would be able to move on. All right, but we don't know. All right, and as it stands, we don't know. And uh, it, when it comes to politics, perception is truth, pretty much. And the perception um, among the electorate is that uh, Waiguru is corrupt, and uh, Waiguru there, um, it trickles down to representing all the other women candidates and uh, female aspirants that we have in the August 8th elections. How do you plan to deal with such perceptions? I think, that, uh, the, I think we have to strengthen our institutions. Mm -hmm. We have to fight for them to be strengthened. And I think we have enough laws. I keep saying this country doesn't need more laws. Mm -hmm. It just needs more good people willing to implement the laws. I mean, the way we, we took the IEBC out, this current IEBC has to conduct a free, fair, and credible election. Mm -hmm. This business of saying, oh, we need a telling center, listen to the voice of the people. If the IEBC is really, truly independent, they should actually listen to the voice of the people. During nominations, all the parties were feeding the elections from the telling centers mm -hmm. in, the, in the ward level, in the count constituency level, and then to the to the, telling, the main telling center. Why, what is so wrong? What is so wrong about concluding at this level, that level, so that you know it was 30 votes here at the ward level, it was 1,000 votes at the constituency level, mm -hmm. all right, when we put everything together, and then it should be 1,000 brought in at the main telling center. Why do you want to actually announce nothing at the beginning and have it announced at the telling center? Mm -hmm. We've seen elections stolen twice. We don't want that anymore. And you know, they keep saying, oh, Raila is probably saying that, um, uh, that he's creating war or he's asking for. No, all he's asking for is a credible election. And a credible election starts from the bottom up. All right. And finally, before Mike jumps in, jumps in speaking of institutional failure, women reps, um, IBC currently is uh, going through the process of verifying candidates uh, for the August 8th elections. We've seen uh, presidential aspirants. We've seen uh, senatorial aspirants um, take in their nomination papers. And women reps will, will be soon to follow. Um, but we've seen in the dailies today several uh, members of parliament saying this is a pro uh, it is a process in futility, the entire integrity question. Your thoughts on that? Um, the, you see, the thing is, again, it's a institutional weakness. I'm presenting my papers uh, today at 10.30 mm -hmm. in Kasarani. I think it's, you know what, uh, we're a young democracy, all right? And people say that, you know, America has gotten where it is for over 200 years. But today, the power of social media, the world is our oyster. We can learn so much. Mm -hmm. We don't need to say we need 200 years to get there. I feel that our institutions, it's about Kenyans. From the voter all the way up to the president, we need to actually elect good people. So the leaders are a representation of the voters. Mm -hmm. If the voters are going to vote because of tribalism, if they're going to vote because of party waves, if they're going to vote candidates for the wrong reasons, right, because they were given some handouts, mm -hmm. then when they get the bad leader, they should not complain. Right. So I'm appealing to Kenyans, when you vote, pray that you vote the right people. But shouldn't all these leaders should, um, have been vetted through the, the, the integrity uh, vetting process? That after that, every other leader is a leader of good integrity, and so anybody is free to choose whichever. Okay, I mean, we saw recently, they went to court and they said, um, oh, these, these 20 people should not run, mm -hmm. all right? For me, it was too late. Okay, it was too late. But the judiciary can still make a decision, all right? So, for me, uh, you know, I, it's a question of justice has to be fair, right. all right? And uh, these are things that we should have addressed six months ago. Why two months after people have campaigned, got their nominations? I mean, you bundle a whole exercise. Because justice has to be fair. The person is not guilty. Mm -hmm. So why is our judicial process taking so long to convict people? Why is it that the DPP is not able to get enough evidence? I mean, if you have stolen, and with the electronic system where you can't even uh, uh, send money unless it's one million shillings, it has to be declared, central bank is involved, it's so easy to prove, but there's no goodwill. And that is why we must send Jubilee home. Mm -hmm. They have no goodwill. And I pray that when NASA comes in, they do it right. Because we are not only looking at the failures of Jubilee, we're making promises that we're going to do things different. We're going to keep the, the price of unga down. I mean, not today I just heard you saying that th there might be contaminated unga mm -hmm. that might kill, kill people. On the social media, we have jokes that we will eat unga the night before elections and wake up and find Jubilee in power. So, you know, <laughs> I have a feeling we're not going to eat unga the night, before, <laughs> the night before elections. But at the end of the day, if we're selling contaminated uh, maize. If we're having businessmen that are bringing in maize 
uh, uh, the orders are coming in, the ship is leaving one or two days before the duty-free declaration. Of course, we have government talking to their friends. This is going to be fun campaign funding. I mean, it is serious. All it right. is serious. And, uh, Esther, maybe as we get to the close of this particular interview, your position as woman rep, should you be elected, is one that is legislative. What is the one thing that you can tell Nairobians now as they're watching that under Esther Passaris, you're going to ensure you push for to make the difference for Nairobi? Okay, first of all, I'm going to push for the laws to be known by the citizens and the laws to be implemented and easily accessible. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be a bridge between the people and the institutions that are meant to serve them. I don't believe I'm going to be looking for new laws. I'm going to be looking for implementation of existing laws to start off with. So what, what do you think is the reason why they're not implemented so far? Okay. Because if that be the case, then what you're saying is that the laws that are there are sufficient. We don't need any adjustment. We have a lot of laws. And before you start looking for new laws, you see, as a woman, before I go shopping to buy vegetables and dry food to cook, I look in my fridge, I look in my cupboard, what do I have? Can I make a meal? Use what I have, make the meal, mm -hmm. and then if I run out of something, I go and buy ingredients. So it's the same approach I'm going to use. Look at the laws that we have. We have a law on sanitary towels, provided free of charge to vulnerable citizens, to our, to our girls. We provide the condoms, but we don't provide the, the sanitary towels. Mm -hmm. There is a law already. Why has Rotich not managed to put a budget to provide the sanitary mm -hmm. towels. Mm -hmm. Why don't we have big institutions manufacturing it? In India, you can get a sanitary towel for nothing. Why, why can't we get that technology, put a factory here, so that we can actually manufacture them at a, at a low cost? Because the government cannot provide everything for free, but there are some situations where it should be for free, mm -hmm. all right? Medical, uh, 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 the expenses of medicine. Why are we paying so much? I'll give you an example. Isaac Ruto received a donation from, uh, from uh, um, uh, um, Saudi of medical equipment. It's sat in the port of, of Mombasa for over a year, all right, mm -hmm. because of government refusing to waive duty. Why was government refusing to waive duty? Was it because of the disconnect between the, 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 the DP and Isaac Ruto? Or don't we understand that this medical equipment came as a donation? It was so shameful that the donor had to finally pay for the duty right. and the demurrage. Right now, we've got the Kabaddi sport. They've got mats donated to them by the Indian government. The mats have been sitting in the port because the government does not have a budget to pay or, or waive the duty. All right, so Surely there's a disconnect. Implementation of the laws is what we need. And as we wind up, your final comments to your supporters and Nairobians this morning. Okay, I mean, I am in ODM, I am in NASA. But what I want to tell the women and the men of Nairobi, I will serve all citizens. Mm -hmm. Because once elected, I am the county woman representative for the entire county of Nairobi. This is a capital city. By extension, I will serve the Kenyan women. Mm -hmm. All right? I will empower you so that you can become independent. Um, I will show you how to do business. I will try and eliminate slums during my five-year tenure, mm -hmm. because we don't want slums. This is 50 years into independence. We had the slum upgrading program. It, it didn't take off. I mean, whatever we achieved was when Raila was in office. We need slum upgrading to continue. We can make it viable. Um, you know, in the Greek government, uh, women are encouraged to have a home before they get married. Mm -hmm. So that in the event that they have a disconnect with the husband, a divorce, etc., the husband is the one that moves out, the woman stays with the house. I want to see every woman have a home. Because this, today I had a phone call from a friend who told me, oh, Esther, my husband's kicked me out from the house. With my children, I've gone to my mother's house. I want to empower the woman so that she has a property that she can use to get a loan facility. She has an idea that can be implemented. The OESO fund, the youth fund, I wanted to reach people. And I basically want to serve you. And to serve you, I need your support. And I also need your vote. Mm -hmm. And let's have a peaceful election. And... But, in, but I, I want to appeal to you, it's time for Baba, all right? Whether you're a Kikuyu, I'm a Kikuyu, and he has my support, all right? Let's not put tribalism into this. Let's vote for him, because he will deliver, and he will make Kenya a better place, and he will unite us. The divisions that have been caused by the Jubilee government will be taken out of government 
for the people of Kenya. All right, and that's a good note there to end the Dawn debate. Aspiring woman representative Esther Pesar is there on an ODM ticket. She will be facing off with incumbent Rachel Shebesh on a Jubilee ticket. And that's a good way to end the Dawn debate this morning right here on Morning Express. We'll take a short break, but do stay with us. When we come back, we did promise to have an interesting debate on the political point this morning. We'll be speaking to independent presidential candidate Michael Mora Wainaina, as well as a presidential candidate date Kuruo Court of the Third Way Alliance Party just telling us what their vision is for Kenyans and why you should vote for them. Do stay with us.